Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. My name is Patrick Kinkoff, and today we are lucky enough to speak with Dr. Paul Lieber, who is a data scientist with the Department of Defense, worked at the Joint Special Operations University. I've been lucky enough to do some work with him uh, more recently. But he uh, came out with an article called COVID in the Information Age, which is pretty eye-opening, talking about um, misinformation, misuse of information, and um, you know how we communicate nowadays and coronavirus is actually the straw that broke the camel's back with a lot of issues that we've been having um, so I wanted to invite him on lucky enough he said yes and uh, he's gonna bring up some topics that may seem controversial to some people but uh, as a data scientist he's got the facts to back him up so I'm actually going to link the uh, article to the podcast here it's fascinating, and uh, being able to talk to him really, really illuminates what he's talking about. So without further ado, Dr. Paul Lieber. No one is ever alone. Not these days. Not with smartphones and video surveillance and social media being used 24-7. I wonder how much they know, how much they've seen. At Equitus, we believe you should own your digital future. This is the alternative. This is the future. This is Equitus. So I was actually watching the news yesterday, and there were, the head of the CDC was holding up the mask, and he was saying, this is the most important way of preventing diseases, the most important tool to you right now. I, I want to get into your article, but how how do you feel about that, about the mask in general, um, how information is being spread accuracy-wise? Is the mask that important? Uh, well, I'm not a medical professional, but I can speak of from what I do know what's public information. Public information that's out there indicates that masks do not prevent any transmission of illness. At best, they protect you from transmitting to others. And it, it's something that, honestly, in, if you're talking of any form of widespread virus, is going to do very little. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it, it's obviously symbolic. Uh, it's, it's now wedded to the political I'm not surprised that an, an official that was placed in this position is going to have strong opinions on symbolism mm -hmm. because their position in general, and the, by the name of the institution, is symbolic. Uh, when this first started, uh, this whole pandemic, I was very vocal mm -hmm. um, in, in stating multiple things about it. The first was the statistical modeling and forecasting was all wrong. It was off of a moving target that was convenience data from individuals that had a vested interest to create chaos. So you can't really... So who has a vested interest to create chaos? China. So oh. this, this, is, this is outside of the U.S. that's starting this. Oh, okay. Well, so the, the virus was started in China, and you think they use this as a tool to, to spread chaos throughout the world? Is that what you're saying? Potentially. Um, yeah. We haven't validated it yet. The available information that's out there points to, of course, it originating in a Wuhan lab in which most individuals that were associated with it, the research, have disappeared is the nice term they That's like convenient. to use. So they've disappeared uh, in whatever way that you want to define that term. Uh, and China, of course, based on historical precedent, has a history of creating very nasty bugs in, in their labs to mm -hmm. include SARS, H1N1, and uh, as we discussed, having lit a one, the gift known as RSV, which every parent, um, I, I'm trying to remember RSV. what it stands for, but it's a very, very potent virus that, okay. that attacks infants very, and it can kill them. A lot of them end up in in uh, emergency care at a very young age, and for a parent, that is perhaps the most terrifying thing. So our our child had it about three times uh, early on. Three uh, times. Yeah, it, it, it's very contagious, um, and so if you have a kid in daycare, it's very likely that he or she will have it at some point. But of course, you develop some uh, immunity to it, or mm. so so over time. So the third time, it's it's respiratory. Uh, and what it, you know, so you're Cough and sneezing, a, yeah, fever, stomach, it's miserable. So they, these are all originated in, in China. These are, again, these, these things that we have information on this. This is nothing new. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been cre creating viruses by accident in quotes for, <laughs> for some time. Yeah. You know, so when this first started, uh, my initial suspicion was I looked toward Hong Kong, saw some riots in the street. I saw some very unhappy uh, uh, members of the Chinese government that were staking a very large claim in the Nine Dash Line, which they were very uh, proactive, be it uh, planting a scene in, in the movie Abomination that depicted this, uh, that's showing that line, what they had with the NBA, the same type of issues that were going on. And what's the easiest way to stop people from creating havoc is 
Keep them home. Keep them inside, yeah. Yeah, so you all of a sudden we have a, a virus of unknown origins and suspicions, and there it goes. Um, that was my initial take on it. That's a geopolitical take on it based on historical precedent. I, I don't think anything I'm saying would catch anybody uh, by surprise. Uh, you know, now, sure, this week there's a scientist that's supposedly associated with it that is willing to speak. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I would think someone that well associated with it doesn't emerge five months later. Um, but I, my suspicion is very strong that that it originated there. And then the information that was presented by China, including the models and forecasts, it, it, obviously they, they uh, through the World Health Organization, as we know, they denied it. Mm -hmm. um, they indicated that people had recovered from it. Um, we were duped, as was the whole world on it. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, what we've discovered over time is that the virus is not very potent. Uh, even the transmission numbers were attached to a moving target. So we don't necessarily know um, you know, what these numbers ever were, are forecasted. All models were wrong. Uh, you can't forecast something without a baseline. It's impossible. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't work. And then, so you shouldn't be predicting off of it. And the second part, uh, in terms of these numbers, uh, th we know that the tests are at best 50% accurate, which means why take them? Mm -hmm. We also know, but we've discovered that uh, the tests are now oversensitive. This is all public information. Yeah. So of the individuals that were diagnosed with it, you don't even know what you're being diagnosed with uh, in terms of the, uh, the nature of the virus and how potent it is. And then, and then the third factor is we're not even sure necessarily how it is transmitted. Um, all these things about droplets in the air, I mean, none of these have ever been validated. Uh, these are just, a lot of that is disinformation mm. that was directly linked to Russia. And this isn't something that I'm, I'm throwing out there as a theory. Uh, about 30 to 45 days into this, there was a, a multitude of articles in mainstream American media pointing to discovery of this virus and the supposed belief systems that were associated with it. Prevention mechanisms were all tied to fake social media uh, generated by Russia. I mean, they linked it right back to them. And then the health information, of course, we knew from the World Health Organization was completely false and more so funded by Chinese interests, which then, of course, had ties here. So back to your original question about the masks, um, I, I, I don't really, you know, it's symbolic. I think this individual, if he, if he states openly the alternative, which is, oh, go forth and, and do whatever, um, you're not the head of the CDC. You're not a medical professional. What you're right. doing is, is at that point in time, you're, you're having an opinion on what is the long-term medical future of the country associated with this virus versus the, what he did was have no opinion. Sure. You know, play it safe, right? Or, or have no opinion. Yeah. I mean, what does a wearing a mask do? It, it frees you from having an opinion um, because it, it frees you from, you know, having some element of a timeline attached to it where you feel that, you know, and these tests, these, these numbers, mm -hmm. um, none of them are, are accurate. Uh, and we know this. Um, yeah. This is not something that is a political statement, unfortunately, is now a political uh, almost call to arms to believe or disbelieve in, in the potency of, of coronavirus and the prevention mechanisms that are there. Um, I don't know why we did this to ourselves, knowing what we know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why we accepted it. And, but once something devolves into emotional logic, it's very hard, if not impossible, to argue with emotional logic with other forms of, of reasoning. So. That's the long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> so this this whole situation, it's from from the data that you have, from the information you have, started um, by nefarious means and has kind of evolved and taken on um, a life of its own uh, through data and information and, and social media. That's also you know inaccurate. That's that's kind of um, you know what your article is about, correct? Yeah, it's. You know, it, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I never would have thought that coronavirus, rather, would be the straw that breaks the camel's back mm -hmm. when it comes to misuse of data and misuse of analysis. Um, apparently, statistics and medical uh, facts or medical uh, just information in general uh, apparently are their most ripe targets yeah. for complete, utter abandon of logic in favor of whatever you see. Um, and I'm... I, it was one of those things where 
what we what we did with this was we attached um, numbers. Mm -hmm. We attached things in in terms of uh, preventative mechanisms and symptoms and and just in general this whole mess that is all associated with data. I mean, what is medical science? It's data. It's a constant collection of information to make a sound decision based on available data. I, I never thought this would be the, the one thing that would literally be the end all that would shut down the world because of its complete lack of understanding of how to use information properly. Mm -hmm. uh, it was inevitable. Um, there's been 20 years of just continuous flow of information in, in increasing bandwidth potential and increasing access, and nobody stopped to do a quality control, quality assurance check. Yeah. So if you're doing that, at some point, individuals are going to fail at the game. Right. Um, if you're not actually thinking back and strategizing about what you're doing, uh, you know, it's like looking at the hockey jersey on the wall. If a player that's a forward on offense doesn't start thinking about his defensive duties, that regardless of how successful he is at whatever facet of the game, that he's focused on offensively, the team will lose. Mm -hmm. And if they win, it, it, they will win either despite him or in lieu of him because of the deficiencies that he's bringing. Sure. So all of this information that we have mm -hmm. at our disposal, it, is, it, it hasn't failed us. We failed each other. Mainstream media has failed us completely. Uh, they have bought into the entire social media data-driven space of clickbait, mm -hmm. of fear-mongering, of presenting analysis versus objective facts. Now, here's the thing that may surprise most. The CDC has never lied throughout all of this. Yeah. In fact, all of the information that, that I have conveyed in terms of what's out there and the struggles and trials and tribulations are all on the CDC website. It's been continuously updated. They have not failed us. Um, those that are responsible for speaking on behalf of the CDC have potentially let us down. Really? So that's really where it goes, where individuals speak out of the realm of, of knowledge. Now, we started this conversation with you asking me what I think about a mask or the symbolism with the CDC director holding up the mask. The CDC director is a virologist at best, mm -hmm. but is no way, shape or form a social scientist, a statistician or has any knowledge of mass communication. That individual should stay in his or her lane. And if there was somewhere... Stay in the lab, let somebody else... No, speak no. on behalf of the known aspects gotcha. of virology and stay in the areas in which you're comfortable and have positive statements. In the history of mankind, there has never been a push for a vaccine, for a virus strain, without long-term knowledge of the effects of it. Of all the illnesses that we have just talked about that had originated in Chinese labs, none of those have vaccines. And, and we've miraculously survived despite that. Uh, so our bodies just learn how to fight it naturally. I don't know. I'm not an expert in it. Gotcha. So <laughs> what I can tell you is, is that from the data that is available, the data points to that our bodies are, the human existence has somehow moved on from COVID-1 to there via COVID-19 and we're still here. Sure. So there's no real reason for these individuals to be speaking and forecasting on information they really don't understand. Um, Anthony Fauci may be a very smart virologist, but he doesn't know anything about statistical modeling or forecasting. I may be a decent data and social scientist. I don't know anything about virology, yeah. so I don't speak about it, nor do I provide my medical opinion on something, except if I'm providing an objective assessment on what data may point to or what other information may be needed. No, that makes sense. And you packed a lot into that answer. Um, and I, I kind of want to unpack that a little bit so dumb guys like me can really, really piece it all together. Um, but basically, it's, it's a, you know, the, the disease started for nefarious reasons and then a lack of quality control of information and the out of control way that information has spread has caused uh, this whole dilemma. Is, is that, you know, kind of generally your point? See, you just proved your own point. It's not a disease, it's a virus. And there you go. You just Fair proved enough. it. Yeah. And that's the thing. A, a virus is something that is obviously, hopefully fleeting. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a syndrome. It is not something that has long-term known effects. Um, a virus is something that originates by some way, shape, or form over a specific period of time 
attach, attacks certain mechanisms of the human anatomy, mm -hmm. human organs, and then we hopefully develop antibodies to it. Um, not all viruses, you know, we, we, some of them we do need help with. Um, but yeah, and the, the thing about this one, from the get-go, the, 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 the nature of COVID-19 was attached to information. I think China and, and Russia are both very, very good at manipulation, and mm. they saw opportunity. And so as this was unfolding, they turned to mechanisms that would create chaos and fear and discord and all of the elements of which that, that would thrive on individuals' lack of ability to understand data mm -hmm. and how to use it. So the one thing there isn't a shortage of is data about COVID. Right. It's all bad. It's all wrong. Yeah, I think in your article it says perhaps a conservative estimate is that 90% of social media content is wrong. And that's where we're getting all of our all of our information these days. Yeah, I would almost say 98% if you wanted to ask my 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 opinion on it. Yeah. The conservative is, is being safe. Why do I estimate it that high? Because most of the information that social media contains or is contained in social media it has an agenda attached to it. it mm -hmm. And its agenda is not necessarily nefarious. Its agenda is to be popular and to create engagement with it and to be associated with a wider communication initiative in which someone or someone's gained some influence or some element of recognition that whatever motivation may be, that it, it benefits that motivation. But here's the thing. So if the information being presented on social media is at best meant to manipulate, mm -hmm. at worst is created by, a, by a individuals or, or peer competitors. Attention uh, seeking type. Oh, falsehoods. Now here's the thing. Disinformation, people don't t typically understand disinformation and social media is the perfect platform for it. What disinformation does is it, it doesn't necessarily feed you lies. It controls the frames of discourse associated with an item. So it gives you frames of discourse, how you talk about a particular topic. OK, so COVID, as an example, what are we talking about? Masks. We're talking about the ability to prevent in some way transmission of something when we, you know, and or what is your social duty associated with something and or how should we deal with individuals that are seemingly vulnerable or can't make decisions for themselves and or what types of state and federal policy should be. See, these are the, the types of frames and it shifts by the, by the day, by the hour. Mm. So what individuals will do, and the best thing that you can do, what our peer competitors do, and it's not just COVID, it's everything, is they control the frames of discussion. So if you control how individuals speak about something, you ultimately control how they reason about something. Now, the problem with social media is it's a popularity contest. It's not necessarily an exchange of information. Mm -hmm. No one has ever gotten smarter reading a Facebook post. So <laughs> I, I, That's fair. No one can argue with that. No. So, you know, at best, you've, you've gotten some element of emotional affirmation mm -hmm. or you've gotten really annoyed enough to unfollow somebody. So what you're looking at here is if the information that is based in social media is either derived from emotional logic manipulation goals or disinformation in which they're controlling the frames of discourse, anything that stems from it in terms of the engagement. So once you have that foundation, then you have how many million interactions with it. It's a web, it doesn't stop. It's, it's like kudzu vine. So what happens is that anything that touches it contains that falsehood. So even though there may be some aspect of, of truth to something like the malaria drug, for instance, mm -hmm. how much confidence do we really have in it? Well, we don't know really what how it can be used or what because there's so much kudzu attached to it. Yeah. It's impossible to really discern and dig so deep. And then do you really trust the information sources that are citing potentially inaccurate information sources to get there? Now, so this the, the data and the information is almost spreading like a virus. Yeah. Yes. Social media is a virus. Yeah, we can make hats. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. We'll make we'll make tons on it. Yeah. But you had mentioned our you know our, our near peer rivals. I spoke with another um, PhD and mm -hmm. uh, JSAO, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and he said that you know there are you know X number of thousand um, psychology PhDs that graduate from the University of Moscow every year. Um, 
they don't believe in mental health over there from, from what I understand. They don't, you know, they don't have shrinks. So they're sending um, these, these psychology PhDs to, you know, the KGB to do psychological operations. And so from, from what I was told is they almost understand our culture better than we do. And, um, you know, they're using that information to do this, um, you know, to, to do this manipulation, the social engineering. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I have very strong opinions on it. I, I think that, that the, the, from my personal experience and the individuals I've interacted within the U.S. and some of our partner nations, um, psychology in particular, um, let, me, let me make a very important uh, distinction they are not mass communicators. Mm -hmm. So psych psychologists understand how individuals reason. Sure. Not necessarily how they communicate, not necessarily what they do with that information, nor anything associated with it. Our psychologists in the US that are employed, the ones I've seen within the US, are there maybe to look at some statistics, maybe provide some explanation and back end analysis. Um, they're not driving the strategic goals and they're not necessarily being put at senior level positions. In fact, you'd be very hard pressed to find legitimate, true social scientists at, that are full, fully employed, non-contract anywhere within the U.S. interagency. Um, strong opinion. I, I really believe this. I've said it before that our, our especially our, our Department of Defense is ascientific. They're anti-scientific. They don't like it, mm -hmm. and 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 they're and what happens is when they're faced with this information, they shut down, and and why Russia is successful is not because they they have psychologists. We have similar similarly trained psychologists, knowledgeable individuals, but we won't trust them to do the job that they need to do. So in Russia, my suspicion I'm not there sitting with the KGB. Sure, if I would, I wouldn't be sitting in this office. <laughs> uh, what they're doing is they're trusting them to make uh, recommendations on manipulation, mm -hmm. on human existence and experience, how they reason about things, and more importantly, those are being factored into the overall strategic picture. Now, disinformation is a classic example. Psychologists understand that it's called therapy. How do you change the way individuals reason about something? You change the way they perceive the entire experience. Sure. You try to encourage them to see things in a framework or in a mechanism of reasoning that is hopefully conducive to them getting better. Mm -hmm. That is psychology. Now imagine if we had the same approach when dealing with COVID and instead of looking at this as let's see what it, what we know about it, likely originated in China. We know that we're not sure of where exactly, but all signs point to Wuhan, the first infection sources were there. We know that it tends to spread. We know it doesn't necessarily impact those that are really young and or those without pre-existing conditions. We know 94%, whatever it is, of individuals that had deaths, deaths attributed to COVID. I don't trust the attribution numbers either. Sure. Um, we know that, that it's really attacking vulnerable people. Um, so what, is, what, are, what would we do if we had psychologists? We would sit there and put out some, some campaigns that would talk about what you can do to stop the spread or what, like exactly what you're seeing. Mm. They're employing them. What, what would Russia do? They would create messaging and frames that would, again, if they're trying to create some aspect of even control within their own country, that would force you into a box. That would force the reasoning strategies in which you can be controlled. If it was peer competitors, they would create campaigns and effects that would have you question everything. Yeah. And that's really what it is. So when I when I talk to people, regardless of their political beliefs, um, and, and that's the thing, like I've 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 made it my goal as a chief scientist to be completely apolitical. Um, I have political opinions, but I don't necessarily apply them deliberately in anything I do. I try to be completely objective. Is that difficult? Uh what it's done is it's made me very sad. Yeah. Um, and it's made me sad to realize how flawed the political system is and also what, how much damage it does to individuals. My biggest regret, and we started this, this talk talking about our, our kiddos, I see so much fear. And the fear is unnecessary. And the fear is so rooted in individuals' political beliefs that if they could just check that at the door and just try to take a step back. 
you know, I, I have indiv individuals by the boatload asking me, is it safe for me to do this? Should I be afraid? And I, I, I tell them, you're okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had a, a room of everyone in this office, say 50, 60, 70 people in this building and say, how many of you think you had COVID? Everyone would raise their hand. And they say, well, when do you think you'd have it? Did you get tested? Well, no, maybe yes, no. Most would say it didn't come up. They'd say, well, I had a really bad cough in January. It lasted a month or I kind of ran a fever for three days. Yeah, we all probably had it. Much like we get every virus that yeah. China loves to give us or even the ones that they don't, like any flu bug or anything that goes around, uh, it, we're all going to get it. I mean, you, you could do the best you can, uh, you know, to try to protect yourself from it. But... You, you know, if it's meant to be, you're going to get it and, and hopefully you'll, you'll be over it. But back to the question about Russian psychologists, they trust them. Mm -hmm. So they see influence as a bigger strategic communication problem set. So the messaging that they put out is part of a wider manipulation influence campaign in which it involves their leadership, it involves their military, it involves their online presence. It's all linked it's up all and synced up. And they know the effects they're trying to reach, and they trust their psychologists when they're doing targeting. You mentioned the KGB. Who are the biggest threats? They trust them to apply their skill sets to make recommendations. We are an abomination at that. I use that term very deliberately. Why do you think? We don't trust our actual scientists mm -hmm. to do science. So data science. We don't trust our data scientists to create better solutions. What we use them to do is to do knowledge management and data organization and write algorithms that look for associations. We don't use our existing data to find the stuff we have, mm -hmm. to find associations that we are ignoring that are right in front of us by doing a little bit of rethinking and trusting the individuals in the data science space to come up with solutions to things from what we have already. We are intellectually lazy because we don't trust science. And until we start trusting it, we're going to really be struggling. The UK is a little better at it. Uh, they've, they've, they, they are a little, a little more willing to invest resources, especially at the university level, mm -hmm. in training individuals to, to apply these, these skill sets, to, to rather to acquire and apply them. I'm guessing that these Russian scientists are being helped along by Russia to acquire these skills that are that are conducive to do so. Now, if you say to somebody, well, you know, is are the intelligence agencies like, for instance, like, let me backtrack. Wouldn't it have made sense 15 years ago when I was completing my doctorate, when research is being put out there for someone somewhere in an intelligence agency or something to say, you're looking at influence and persuasion modeling as it relates to online threats. And what you're doing is you're looking at individuals, how individuals reason about reasoning. It is a, a sweet spot for yeah. anyone in intelligence to then turn around and say, well, it's not hard to find it. You just literally have to look at any academic journals or things you, you find me and say, "Are you? would you be interested in helping us create a program or something like that? Well, sure, now I'm, I'm linked to in initiatives that do that. But back then, they weren't really interested in it. Um, and, and it was not, it's not a statement that I'm that important. It's more so there wasn't really an initiative to even think that way. Why? When Russia had been doing it in the Cold War 20, 30, 40 years ago, yeah. they were thinking that way. So I, it's a long answer again to what you asked. I, I, I really, I challenge our country to start trusting its scientists and to not put our scientists like Anthony Fauci in situations where they are doomed for failure. Do not set him up for failure. Do not put him in a role to have to publicly speak about policy. Let the man be a scientist. Do not force him to give his opinion about whether or not we need a vaccine to do something. True, very true. But so it's, and we'll go back to Facebook and me being, me being dumb and looking at a meme, but they showed, it was a picture of Uncle Sam and it was with a little brain and big arms explaining kind of our, our um, Department of Defense or kind of military strategy where we want to, we're, we're all for us and we almost don't, don't put the thought behind it. And I almost think that kind of like... No, that's so not true. No? That's not fair. No. I, I, I think what we have in our military is a, it, it, we, we, there's, there's lots of brains there, mm -hmm. but we have a culture. And the culture determines the reasoning. 
and, the, and, and in terms of the pathways that we take. Um, we are not dumb. Mm-hmm. We are very good at what we do. We are the world's leading military force and mine for a reason. Uh, our peer competitors may disagree, but we are. That's how we're brokering peace in the Middle East, because we have credibility. Um, but we have a, a, a system that is designed to reward individuals who take particular pathways. Now, this isn't to say that you can't take that pathway and divert a little bit and still get there. Like uh, There's been many people... Uh, I won't name names, but there's been many people that I've worked with uh, at the flag officer level that were willing to do that. They were still successful at, at checking the box with, mm-hmm. the, you know, with the flexed arm. But they, at the same token, they also were willing to kind of quietly, not as for full statements of slamming a, a fist on the table, uh, but they were willing to try some other more... Uh, you know, uh, not just scientific, but more, you know, outside the box type of things. Now, that's a little dangerous in the military, isn't it? It is. Career-wise. It, it is. In, 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 but it depends on how you how you do it. Um, we, you know, I, I for instance, you know, I, I'm, uh, I don't mean to critique it openly, but I'm going to critique it openly. I'm just not a fan of design thinking. And mm-hmm. the reason I'm not a fan of it is I think it's an intellectual bandaid. What it does is it, it allows individuals, it forces them into coming up with new ways of thinking about thinking, but doesn't actually produce any outcomes. Mm -hmm. So you're left there saying, okay, well, I'm still looking at information, the same information, just in a different way. Um, Now, now you may challenge me and say, well, didn't you just say to look at the information you already have in a different way? But it's not making you smarter in how to organize the information, process the information, combine it with other uh, types of information, and more importantly, it doesn't really encourage you to think uh, in a diverse fashion. Mm-hmm. So using the data science and social science example, um, the best solutions come from diverse teams of individuals that really have nothing in common. We can come at it from different angles. Yes, and ha- don't have overlapping expertise. Um, excellence happens when you have two people or more working on a project that they're mutually exclusive of their talents and they have potentially conflicting views on other things. The irony of the situation is when I was working on that same doctorate, uh, a person who found my research was uh, an Australian. Sorry, he was actually, he'd be very upset if I said this. He's a Kiwi that was getting his doctorate in Australia that was focusing on corporate social responsibility, but was a strictly qualitative researcher. He was interested in the stuff I was doing for how it relates to that aspect of decision making. Uh, And... It ended up, we collaborated, did a, a cross-cultural analysis between the U.S. and Australia and New Zealand, and boom, there was my dissertation and there was um, research, and we've collaborated ever since. We don't share a single um, political viewpoint mm-hmm. that is anywhere on the same standard deviation. We are completely, sure. we disagree on everything. Complete opposites. Yeah, but I love the way he thinks. True scientist. So it's great, and he's done very well for himself, uh, and we've collaborated many times because we don't have anything in common. And it's it's a it, you don't have to. I feel like you really have to check your ego to be able to to do that. Yeah, you know what you got to do is you got to listen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I try. I, I have very, you know, strong opinions on things I think that are that I have knowledge on, but I, I'm also very very willing, more so, you know, than I am to speak to 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 shut up and, and actually figure out what somebody's saying that may broaden my understanding of what I know. And I don't even know if it's so much ego, it's just, it's a willingness to stop talking. And start listening. Yeah, and back to your question about DOD, I think that that is probably one of our greatest obstacles in how we use our scientists. We, we see our scientists as sage on the stage, individuals who come in and espouse wisdom. Uh, and so they'll give a lecture, they'll provide something meaningful. But really, what if you're really good at what you do, your, your goodness is measured not by your opinions, but your ability to remain objective when looking at others' opinions. Mm-hmm. See, those are the two different approaches to science. Um, I am steadfastly committed to being objective, hence why I'm, I try to not be political at all. Sure. Um, it doesn't, you know, again, sometimes I succeed at it, sometimes I don't. I do have opinions on it, but it, sh- it shouldn't, if I'm doing my best, impact how I perceive something. Still, um, in the U.S., and again, it's not necessarily their fault. It's just how our information is presented to us. I mean, we invented Hollywood, you know, for, for crying out loud. Uh, 
we like celebrities. We like individuals that are presented in a heroic, meaningful fashion. And put up on a pedestal. And we don't even seek to even challenge or question the means to the ends and the ends to the means. Uh, LeBron James is a classic example, a, a perfect, a perfect epitome of, of, of a complete confusing jambalaya of different messages and principles and, and, and they're incompatible with each other. But we don't even know how to make sense of that. So we just look at it and we, have, we, we all form strong opinions about our country's most popular athlete. Um, we don't even know what, where they're based on. We just have opinions. Um, just because he says it. Yeah, and that's the military, how they use our, our, our subject matter experts. Mm-hmm. They use them to be in front and loud and proud versus using them as trusted advisors in quiet rooms that are there in which you're not really sure of the contributions they're making. It's word of mouth in terms of how you know individuals that are linked to them, how they know what they're doing. Um, that's Russia's model. Yeah. They use their scientists as scientists. Scientists are not individuals that unless they're asked to speak about a particular topic, are first and foremost out there. Um, if you look if you online, you're not going to see very many outspoken Russian scientists. They don't need to be outspoken. And they probably would disappear if they were. But with that being said, they don't need to be. That's not their role. They're almost pulling the strings type of thing. Or they're helping do quality control, quality assurance checks. It's, I like to call it like the visual, like I mean, see, the actual example of if you visualize a regression line where things are, they're hammering down those dots, everything yeah. lines up. And that's what they're doing. So, you know, I, I've been very fortunate for the good people I've worked with and for I've been able to serve in that capacity. So I've been able to go over with them what their challenges are in a, in a quiet environment, in a trusted environment, provide recommendations and guidance and continue on throughout the day. Um, you know, it's it's I offered multiple individuals at the state level, federal level to provide them help with COVID. Um, they all either ignored it or admitted to me they were so overwhelmed they didn't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of the discussion. Wow. So it, I can only offer to help. And and what I learned is is this this information overwhelmed the people who were responsible for acting on the information. Very scary premise. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Um, so I want to go back to something you said, uh, and kind of kind of tie a couple things together. So you mentioned that uh, you know the Russian information operations they're good at pushing pushing us into a box, like a, a, a box in our way of thinking. Um, and I think a lot of groups, political groups, and activist groups, and just kind of groups around the country are, are doing something similar using emotional logic. You'd mentioned emotional logic before. Can you kind of dive into that and, and you know, give me some examples? Sure. Uh, emotional logic is when you believe something based on how you feel. And so if you if you believe, for instance, that, you know, that uh, it's OK for your child to take a long flight, COVID or otherwise, or that it's OK to do this or that or it's OK, your logic is based on how you feel. And you can't argue with someone's feelings. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get anywhere. And the more that their logic becomes entrenched with how they feel about something, uh, it, it won't, it won't, there's no way to break through that. In fact, they hunker down and they fight back harder. Um, and, you know, and, and putting us in a box, I, I think what, what's even more important is, is not the box itself. It's, it's again, the reasoning that takes place within that box. And a lot of these, these, you know, interest groups and things are, they're all, they have tentacles that all extend through peer competitors and other individuals and organizations that, that don't have good intentions. So they're just feeding off of each other. They know, more importantly, that when that's when they set the frames of discourse, which they're doing very deliberately using algorithms and individuals and deep fakes and all those things, they know how we reason. And that's the problem. So there are very, for decades, there are a mass studies out there on how individuals going back to psychology yeah how they reason about information that they receive and more importantly what behavioral intent could be linked to it now is this specifically the united states is this cultural they just in general how humans reason well they cultural i I think that they're attacking the u.s because we're easy target we're you know and and they're attacking social media that we use. Yeah. So I'm sure they're attacking other platforms that are not in our language we don't use. What makes us such an easy target? Um, 
No, we get so much of our information culturally from it. We trust it. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, you go to other countries that don't have so much media and so much 24 seven appetite for this nonsense. Uh, it, it won't work. I lived in Australia for two years. And the thing about Australia is every house has a little jack in the wall. Um, you get government TV, like eight channels. Mm -hmm. Every eight? Or something like that. I think it's probably more. Free. Everyone oh, gets okay. it. Just plug in. You get government. No one pays for cable television or they, can, they call pay TV because they see it as a waste of time and a waste of money. They're right. It's really bad. So I, I tried it and then I'm, there's nothing on it of any saving grace. <laughs> so that's how you realize at that point that all the information that you're getting is, is, is you really, it's, it's not even just overload, it's useless. But here's the problem with the Australian model. It's government provided information. Uh, they have a very, they, they, it's funny, they call it tall poppy syndrome, which is when individuals get too big for their britches and they, and they start, you know, they, they, they don't see things for what they are and they like to chop down tall poppies. So that's their culture. And, mm -hmm. and of course they think the Brits are the worst defenders of it because of the Commonwealth connection. Of course. And they, of course, this, because they sent them there. So, but, but, <laughs> but, the, but the thing about it is that Australians don't really hold much value. They don't, they don't really see social media as that. And they use it, but it's not going to drive their decision-making as much. Um, their culture will drive it. Um, there's so many underlying nuances to Australian culture. It's like African-American culture. Um, Nonverbals are king. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't read nonverbals and you're trying to communicate with somebody who identifies, you know, like culturally as African-American and then relies on those cues, uh, you know, that you could say a whole lot by saying nothing. Australians are very also nonverbal culture. Uh, if you can read each other pretty well, you can, you know, you don't have to say much in a meeting. It's, it's you know when it's time to end it. Right. And you also know when it's going south really quickly. There's so many nuanced meaning behind it. that the little things that they do. But our social media that we do, one of the things that, you know, but again, I, I, I think it's overpopulation too, that I'm thinking out loud in the US and, and the competition for resources and space and relevancy, that we seek any form of affirmation a lot more than, than other places. Well, I mean, in terms of a, a free country where there's a caste system or there isn't a, an authoritarian government with a thumb on your head, I mean, how many are there out there of our size? I mean, you're pretty much looking at it. So, the, so we have this, this system in place in which individuals, you know, that, that there's such a competition in this, in, you know, what should be a free market open access that we respond to communication simply by responding. Um, we don't actually see any value in a considered response or some aspect of involvement that, you know, everything is, is you know, it's funny because P.T. Barnum invented pseudo events, the concept of it. How, when he invented the circus. So okay. when, when the first Barnum and Bailey circus started, uh, P.T. Barnum's entire premise of a circus was to create fake events. So he created these big momentous things that would happen and you'd have to go to a circus to see it. That's how he created it. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really, the, the event itself, that's the press conference. What really is it? Ah, it's a pseudo event. There, there's so many mass communication studies uh, that point to how ultimately you, you take enough journalists together and they, all their stories start mirroring each other in terms of how they cover it, what is, not anymore because it's 24-7, but what items are most important to them, how much saliency they, they you know, they, they, they put into particular uh, source usage, all that stuff. So we're just in a society where we communicate for the sake of communicating. So if Someone sends you a text message, you send a text back. Do you even remember what you said the next day? You don't no. care? Exactly. Okay, cool. Or, or you know. But even if it was an exchange, it's just, okay, you're doing tasks. You're not communicating. Right. Or Facebook, you're affirming or you're doing something. It's a song and Hitting dance. Hitting the like button. Or exactly. Or Twitter. I mean, what are you really doing on Twitter? You're driving some weird trending engine that isn't really trending. Yeah. Well, and so you brought up in your article... Um, you know, communication dominated by hashtags, retweets, um, and memes. So I'm trying to connect the nonverbal communication. Are those ways of attempted nonverbal communication through social media, at least the memes? Because you got the picture um, kind of emphasizing the words. Is there anything? 
Well, people are so bad at communicating, and that's not me sitting there saying, get off my lawn. I think that they've, they're so overwhelmed by information 24-7, which is why we were stuck with COVID um, in this stalemate, mm. that, that to them, what hashtags, memes, and others offer is a collection of principles in which the way the data is organized and presented encapsulates different perspectives. So if something is trending, you're relevant. The type of terms that are, that are being used there are creating some element of intellectual branding in which you have some aspect of self or some identification of, of where you belong, of identity attached to that. The meme, of course, is a usually sarcastic method of, of involving a multitude of concepts in a particular form of presentation uh, in which you could say a lot by just do, and it's open to interpretation too. Sure. So individuals are so bad at communicating that they have <laughs> to use alternate methods that that incorporate different mechanisms of communication because they can't actually communicate. Heaven forbid you ask somebody how their day is and, act, and expect a legitimate response. And if you get one, what are you going to do with it? And then what is the next? So now that you've opened up, what is the consequence of it? Do you? form a tighter relationship with that individual? If you don't know them, should you be acquainted with them? Is it awkward that you've just done that without doing it? I, what do you do with it? You really make me overthink all my social interactions right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it is interesting when you start breaking down those, those barriers. And, and, you know, we like to say that there are people who use social media and there are people who don't. That's very black and white thinking. Social media should be used for a particular purpose and should be understood as such because that's how it is intended. Um, but it is it is now absorbed traditional communication and being wedded to emotional logic. It has been bastardized to a point where people don't know how to communicate anymore. Yeah. And and instead of actually figuring out and processing the information that they have, they want more information. And then what do you get? More of the same. Yeah, more chaos, right? Yeah. You know, but you look at you look at Facebook. And you look at how, at how individuals communicate and you look at the algorithms, it's very easy for anyone, and I've done it, to look at it and say, honestly, I really don't care if you agree with me. And it's not because I'm a narcissistic egomaniac, but because I don't need congruence for me to have opinions and feelings on things. You uh, need I'm someone to justify you. No, I'm more than willing to have a conversation with somebody and learn and grow and maybe alter my opinion, but I don't need you or anyone, not you, proverbial you, sure. to, to validate me. So, yeah, and so and I, it's okay. Um, and with that being said, I therefore have absolutely no incentive to post what I'm thinking or feeling on Facebook because it has no value to me. Yeah. So I challenge individuals when they're faced with things like coronavirus to use their brains and not the information being presented to them in that order. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at the information, we know what is factual, not because the media said it, we know what is there, the actual information that's there. Uh, I don't wanna get into an argument what is fact versus logic, that's whatever, that's great. Sure. But more so, we know what's there. We know what we can do to prevent the spread of a virus. We know what data is actually there that we can act on, and we know what are things that have happened. If we all took that road, and didn't change anything we did, we would have zero outcome difference, none. So the question you're probably gonna ask, or ask is, so should we really shut down the entire world? I would say no. And the reason I would say no is we don't have enough information still at our disposal to have justified what we did and the amount of lives that we ruined because of it. I'm not gonna make the economic argument. I'm talking about the PTSD, trauma, yeah. people who've killed themselves out of depression, by the Stuck at home. People with chronic illnesses that couldn't get medical care are, are, are elderly that we left to die in nursing homes. We claim we're protecting them. Uh, people that don't have any any roofs over their heads anymore because they lost their jobs. Uh, we, we could have probably just done what we did based on the information we have and nothing would have changed. Now, I challenge that that would have happened for that to have not been attached to emotional logic and political opinion. Mm -hmm. Good luck. <laughs> but, yeah, know, it's impossible these days, it's, or seemingly. It's hard. Um, it's hard. But what it requires is a lot of humility and, and a willingness. When somebody says something that may shake your 
insides with like, wow, that's out there to not take it personal. And it's not a reflection of you or of them. So, you know, you kind of talked about Russia putting us in a box in the same same context as, you know, these these activists and whatnot. Is is this, you know, being pushed along maybe by them um, to create some some divide within the country? I know they're they're trying to create social discourse. Is this one topic that that you have any insight? Are are they pushing on on the um, you know the the race and and all all of this? Sorry, I mean, that was poorly poorly worded. No, no, I, it, it's it's uh, no, I get what you're saying. We, what you're what you're getting at is this any more or less different than than their usual strategies? Are they doing something toward a particular outcome they normally wouldn't? The scary thing is this is business as usual. Really? Um, yeah, they they uh, I mean the election meddling, um, the Occupy movements. Uh, the anti-vaccination movement are all Russian based. Uh, can, you, can you say that again? Because I've got some friends that, that need to hear that. It, just Google it. Yeah. It's right there. I mean, it, it, this isn't my opinion. This is not like uh, if you want to talk politics, this isn't Breitbart's view of the world. Sure. I mean, the Russia created the anti-vaccination movement. They nurtured it along to create chaos. They created the social unrest movements that were the ones that were citing from years ago, the Occupy movements to create racial disharmony in this country. They fed that through the information through their, through their, that they, they put out there. They, and I don't know who necessarily funded these. Um, I'm sure people in the in, in, in Department of Justice and things have better links or treasury to the funds that are there. Um, the other part of it is we know the election meddling. They don't care who wins. Yeah. What they care about is we have no confidence in our institutions of governance and in the individuals that are in charge of it. It creates opportunity for them to operate freely in other continents and regions and places because we have no confidence in the individuals that we have elected to do that for us to protect those places. So if we're if we're weaker, they're they're stronger. They can do whatever. They Not want weaker. To do. If we are in in disharmony, mm-hmm. they are stronger because they have an approach that is calculated, that is strategic. We are not because our organizations, our institutions are designed. We have intentionally a system of governance that separates branches. That alone is why they have so much success in this. And the way that our communication institutions are designed is they have perceived autonomy with some regulation, which is perfect for them. It's perfect for anyone. You know, it's like, for instance, if you want to sell uh, uh, fruit juice, Mm -hmm. To, to people that are trying to lose weight, um, start a lobbying movement about the danger, dangers of aspartame. Um, <laughs> hey, it worked. Yeah, no, fair enough. Remember that movement? I mean, it's 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 not hard. Or if individuals are using a particular type of, of uh, you know material or, or whatever it is, just push the harmful effects. It's, it's all manipulation. Just backdooring everything in? It's all manipulation. Wow. So... Dr. Lieber, before I let you go, I've got one more quest, personal question that I've sure. always, always, um, I've, I've been asking since I started learning about this topic. And you may not have an answer, but I still want to ask it. If I go on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever right now, and I look at a meme, what do you think the chances that it's Russian or Chinese or some foreign influencer? Ooh, good question. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or someone that has some ties to, uh, so, you know, an organization or something that has the ability to gain from it. I, I would, I would state that with pretty good confidence today. Not in the origin, original memes where people were doing cat memes. And things. Sure. I'm talking if you're looking at something that has content in it that is sensitive to someone. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing there is an organization, a, a country, or individuals that have a very strong vested interest in presenting that agenda. Um, the problem is, too, that even going further, I mentioned deep fakes. <clears throat> it is very difficult, near impossible, to identify content that was created for, that is completely n- non-factual. Uh, there are algorithms that can detect it by the signature, mm. but the human eye or ear cannot detect them. So, you know, this is... No kidding. Yeah, it's... It, that's, that's scary. No, it's, it's, it's what individuals with bad intentions have done for quite some time. So the, the problem with that is uh, one of the most popular uses of it is, as you can imagine, one of the Internet's great success stories is porn. So they'll create uh, pseudo porn, really? placing someone's head on a body, yeah. 
and blackmail the person into paying a sum to have it removed. But once it's out, the damage is done. You can try to, even if it's not even you. Yeah. But they can do it so well and it, that you will never, you can look at it a hundred times, you will not be able to tell the difference. Uh, yeah, there are algorithms that do it. Wow. So memes, Technology's yeah. Technology's scary. It, yeah, but then you have to say to yourself, this is why you asked me 90% of content, I said maybe 98, because none of it is actually there to inform. It's there to, to create some aspect of, I believe, emotional response. And, and some form of engagement associated with it and towards some end that isn't really in your best interest, probably ever. Yeah. So when you say that, if you look at internet content, you say, well, you know, like, should I still engage with it? Yeah, I mean, if you know what it is, mm-hmm. there's no reason not to. I'm not saying to become, you live, in, live like a hermit in the mountaintops and stop absorbing it, but I wouldn't say fear it, um, you know, and also too, don't get duped into going so down a well you can't see the top again uh, of it you know I, I i long for the day it's it's funny that that you know that people make educated decisions on things that are important to them uh, i said it's funny because i think about the ballots that we cast here in florida in which they don't even you can't they don't even tell you the political parties of the individuals and more importantly good luck trying to find out platforms of individuals on the ballot and information on how they distinguish are distinguishable you, you have to dig for hours to cast this absentee ballot that everyone lives in terror and awe of mm-hmm. to make an informed decision. But there's so much crap out there telling you that these candidates are either saints, saviors, or Satan, that that you can find without any information yeah. attached to it. And it's so easy to be lazy and do that, right? Yeah, but if I want to know how this individual feels about some aspect of environmental policy as it relates to whatever... I may have to spend three hours finding out when they cast some wackadoo vote in some session or help write some policy or as a lawyer served on some committee or some, you can't find it. No. But why is there infinite amounts of social media dedicated to convincing me whether they're, they're great or not? That's part of the problem. Yeah. Dr. Lieber, thank you so much for coming out. Um, you know, specifically for me, getting this lesson on, on social media and information, just kind of how to digest everything and, and find the right information I know is helpful. Um, I know I have a lot of friends and, and colleagues uh, that have a similar similar issue with, with social media and, and where we get our information. Um, I'm going to post, if it's all right with you, I'm going to post your article on the link to this uh, podcast so that everyone can read it. It's amazing. It's very informative. Um, Paul, thanks for coming out. Sure. Hopefully we can get you to come again. Sure thing. Thank you.